show that rewards the one who can best misuse Bible verses. Let's meet our contestants. Now, Helen, it says here that your favorite thing about the Bible is using it to make yourself seem right. Tell us about that. Yes, well, I just get so much joy knowing how proud God is of me, and I use scripture so that everyone will know it. <laughs> that brings us to Doug. He enjoys asking intelligent questions and rational thought. Doug, tell us why you're a downer. I'm not a downer. I'm not a downer. I just don't think verses should be used uh, by... Uh, don't judge me or you two will be judged. Oh, double points oh. for both rudely interrupting and misusing scripture. <laughs> for that, Helen gets to use all of her stone-slinging skills to throw Bible verses at Doug's face. <laughs> hey, well, it looks like it. Helen is extending her lead, but when it comes to misusing scripture, it's anybody's game here on... <laughs> We'll be back after this sermon from a pastor. <laughs> All righty. So who remembers the last sermon? Can I get a frau frau? Okay, I believe that today is very important, and I've been waiting to preach this message for quite some time. It just happens to fit into this sermon series, so I love it, because I've really been waiting for this to really bring it to you, okay? Um, <laughs> this is really one of the most misused scriptures by non-Christians and Christians alike, okay? Because people who don't even believe in the Bible know this verse, because they will quote it off by heart, judge not, All right? And this is one of the worst case scenarios that we can find. And you can look all over the show. And the problem is, and the thing that I've picked up, right, is in any subculture, what is a subculture? The biking culture is a subculture. The, the gothic people is a subculture. The emo children subculture, all right? Now, any alternative subculture like that, the number one thing that they will say is, I do not attend church because they judge me. The number one thing we hear from a subculture's mouth or an alternative culture's mouth is just the men's judge ones for scrickling. Man, those people can judge. We hate them. Who are they to judge? Right? Wie van jullie het nog nooit die woorde gebruik? How many has never ever said the words, I am judged, or I feel judged, or someone judges me? We've all used it. Do we understand the context of what Jesus meant. Because you see the scripture in Matthew 7 verse 1 to 2, you can read it on the screen. It says, do not judge or you too will be judged. Now those are the words of Jesus. If you have a red letter Bible, it'll be in red, okay? But no one ever says it like that. It's always in a, in a kind of attitude, kind of arrogant way. Do not judge. Uh-uh. You dare not judge me. And if you want to make it even sound more spiritual, you say it in Old King James. Do not judge lest ye be judged. <laughs> right? And we do that. But here it says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Come on, how many people will throw this in your face? Ah, uh -uh, don't judge me. You have no right to tell me how to live. I can live my life the way I want. As long as it makes me happy, you're a sinner too. So who are you? I can live my life. I can do what I want. doesn't matter what I do as long as it makes me happy. The way I live doesn't matter. Even if it hurts people, it's okay. But you, you can't judge me because you're a sinner too. You have mistakes too. Who are you to say that? And we've got to be very careful in this, because if we mess this up, it can hurt our Christian witness more than anything else. If we misinterpret this, and it feels horrible to be judged on both ends, whether you are judged right or judged wrong, it feels bad. But the problem is, is, is let's for a moment entertain this idea that what Jesus says here means we will not judge at all. Like most of us read the scripture like this, through the Anna. Most of us read it like that. You highlight just the one portion, judge not, and you don't even see the rest of the scripture. Because, ooh, Jesus said, judge not. Uh-uh. Sis. Uh-uh. 
Jesus said it, and we like that. But is that what Jesus really meant? Because if we look at that, if we, if we say we are not to judge, then let's quickly play with that idea. Then, then no teacher has the right to judge an essay. Because who are you to say that it's worthy of an A or a B or a C? You're not allowed to judge. No citizen should be allowed to sit in the jury of a court to judge the innocence or the guilt, the, the, how much the, the person is guilty of the crime. Why? Because who are you to judge? Jesus said, judge not. Think of it. Come on, if we're not to judge, then a metro police officer doesn't have the right to pull you off and say, you're on the wrong side of the road. Who are you to tell me? I feel like driving on this side. It's my road. Judge not. Come on, think of it. You see, at, at maybe at some level, we are allowed to judge. Think of it. Let me ask you a couple of questions, maybe just to get you going. Are you allowed to judge the weird hairstyle of the person next to you? I don't look at them if they have one. Just like, kijk voor to. Don't judge. Maybe, maybe you don't like someone's music, or, or maybe you don't like their taste in food. Are you allowed to judge them on that? Maybe some random guy gets a tattoo that's not your liking. Are you allowed to judge that? Or a Facebook update? If a random guy looks at pornography or has an affair with someone else while he's married, are you allowed to judge that? Or maybe your best friend who's a Christian and he believes and his Facebook status says, Christian. And this guy is stuck in pornography and has sex with prostitutes while he's married. Are you allowed to judge and speak into his life because of the sin that's in his life? Are you allowed to? Well, let's think of this way, right? Culture says, culturally it's correct. It's okay, it's acceptable to have sex with anyone. It's passed by law. Homosexuals, lesbians, it's all good. As long as you have fun and enjoy life, it's good. You can have sex with anyone. Okay, that's what culture says. Are you allowed to judge that? What if the person being having sex with is a 12-year-old? What if that 12-year-old is your daughter or your sister? Are you allowed to judge it then? You see, we're very quick to say don't judge, but we're very quick to pass judgment. We don't understand this scripture completely. And what I want to do today is maybe untwist the way that you've understood this and help you to see that maybe at some level Jesus was saying that we should judge. Because Jesus wasn't teaching us in this portion of scripture not to judge. He was, was teaching us how to judge correctly. Because we just see judge not, but we don't read the rest of the context. So who remembers in the last sermon, what are the three things that we do when we interpret Scripture correctly? So let's do that. The first thing is you've got to look at the context. So you look at the Scriptures before, the Scriptures after, the book before, the book after. You see what is the context of the Scripture? Who wrote it? To whom it was written? What was the theme, the general theme behind it? That's the context. The second thing is, what do we do? We interpret Scripture with Scripture. So we take the Bible and see if this theme is mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. Okay, And then the third thing is, you actually apply it to your lives, because it doesn't help you interpret Scripture, you know what it means, and then you just let it go, because then you're ignorant, it's a sin, and you will be punished for that. Why? Because any form of ignorance is still a sin if you know the truth. So, let's quickly look at number one. What is the context of this? Okay, what comes before Matthew chapter 7? Aha, it's not a trick question, Matthew 6 comes before Matthew 7, right? It's easy. It's not rocket science to interpret the Bible. So if you look at Matthew chapter 6 and you read throughout the whole of chapter 6, you will find that the main theme throughout chapter 6 is hypocrisy. Why? Jesus is taking on the Pharisees to a very extreme degree because they are hypocrites by what they speak and what they preach. They do not live or what they speak of. They just, they're easy to preach, but they don't live what they preach. So you can read it, verse 2, verse 5, and verse 16, Jesus takes on the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Now in the same chapter, in chapter 7, 
where Jesus speaks that we shouldn't judge, later on in that chapter, while he's talking about do not judge, he actually says, beware, watch out for false prophets. Okay, so how do you watch out for a false prophet if you're not allowed to judge? Because what does it mean to judge? It means to have an opinion between right or wrong. It means making a decision on what is fair and what is unjust. That's judging. You see, so every day you judge. When you decide to brush your teeth or not, you judge. Is it good to brush my teeth? Is it not? Whether you decide to take a shower or not, you're passing a judgment. But when it comes between personal relationships, it's important to know how we should judge. See, Jesus was never saying don't judge at all. He was saying judge correctly. Let's read it in Matthew 7, verse 3 to 5. If we read the rest of the scripture to get the context, it says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? Verse 5, you hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will clearly see to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So does Jesus say, don't touch the speck in your brother's eye? No, no. He says, deal with your own crap first and then speak into your brother's life. Why? Because then you need to. Then you have the right to. We need to pass judgment. Come on, how many Christians? God is love. Let's all love one another. We will love the sin out of you, brother. Rubbish. Judgment is there for a reason. We need to help one another. Jesus never said, don't judge at all. He said, don't be a hypocrite when you judge. He said, judge, but judge fairly. Don't be a hypocrite. So, Jesus is not telling us not to show discernment in life. He never said we shouldn't correct one another because we take correction as judgment. We hate it because who are you to correct me and judge me? See, but Jesus never said that. He just said, don't judge hypocritically. So let's look at it. Let's interpret Scripture with Scripture. And we see four things that the Bible says about how we should judge. What is clear about judging? The first one is that we should never judge superficially, all right? Never superficially. John 7, 24 is also in red, if you have a red letter Bible, so it's the words of Jesus. You can't argue that unless you want to stand before God and have a debate. You will, you will lose, you know, read the story of Job and see how badly you will lose, but you can try. But in John 7, 24, it says, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. So the same Jesus that said, judge not, in Matthew, now says, judge correctly. So does the Bible contradict itself? No. You just misinterpret Scripture to think that Jesus said, don't judge. Jesus is saying, judge correctly. So don't judge superficially. And this is probably the one where we all fall flat on our faces and do, right? Because every single one of us judge superficially. How can you say that? Well, look at that lady there. She's so stuck up. Kijk hoe trek ze aan. Kijk hoe doen ze make up. Stuck up poppy die. How do you know? Do you know her? Have you done the, the effort to get to know her? Yeah. Look at this guy on Facebook. He thinks he's everything. He thinks he's got it all. Right? But who's the one obsessing over social statuses? So who should be judged? Come on. I mean, to buy a geld. I'll go buy a bike for himself. So? Do you know how much they give to the church? Do you know how much they put in to God's kingdom? Do you know how much they do for other people with their finances? No, you just see the one part. Come on, and I'll say it. A lot of people are against Rama and Ray McCauley because of, look at how much money he's got. I studied under him. I can take you to all of the places that he's influenced with his money and his authority in the church kingdom. Stop judging superficially because you don't have any right to say that. 
Maybe that girl is putting on so much makeup because she doesn't want you to see the bags under her eyes because she's crying her heart out every night because her mom is lying sick in bed with cancer. Have you ever thought of that? Because maybe then you'll show some compassion. I saw a video once that said, maybe we should treat everyone as if they're going to die tomorrow because maybe then we'll have compassion towards them. And it's quick for us to judge superficially. It's quick to judge someone's appearance. It's quick to judge how someone looks. It's quick to judge how someone speaks. It's quick to judge how someone dresses. But do you know them personally and have you got the right to do that? You see, Jesus said, don't judge superficially. Judge correctly. The second thing that we find is never judge hypocritically. And this is where Jesus was coming to when he spoke about his verse on judgment. You see, we point out the sin of others doing the same thing, then we condemn ourselves. That's what we do. If we point out the sin in other people, but I myself have that very same sin, I'm condemning myself. You see, but I'm allowed to help you. If I don't have a drug addiction, yes, I might be stuck in something else, but if I am free from drugs, I can help you. I can speak into your life. And you can't go like, We all have sin. But I'm not allowed to judge you on the same sin that is in my life unless I've overcome the sin in my life. You see, Paul says in Romans 2 verse 1 and verse 4, we'll read verse 1 first. He says, you may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do the very same things. And then in verse 4 he says, and just listen to the grace with which he says this. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that His kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Why? Because once I'm turned from my sin, I can reach out and I can help others with their sin. It's always been God's heart. God's heart was never, don't judge. Don't say that person is wrong. No, no. God is saying, just fix your own heart and then go and judge. Go and speak into that person's life. Go and help that brother or sister. We've got to understand this. Because if we miss this, we miss a whole big portion of what God has called us to do in life. You see, we love to accuse others and excuse ourselves. We love it. Come on, especially if you look at racism. How many of us accuse others, another nation, another race, because they're stupid, because they're this, because they're that, who are you to say that? Because maybe he didn't have the privilege to grow up the same way in the same house that you did, and maybe there's a reason for his life. Why don't you pray for that man? But we judge And we accuse them and say they should have, bring the death penalty back for those people. But what if your own son needs the death penalty? No, no, we like to point the finger, but don't point the finger back at us. Oh, no. Because we are righteous, man. There's nothing wrong with us. There's a lot wrong with us. And we need to be humble enough to see that. Let me say this. Your harshest judgment on someone else will often reveal your deepest weakness. If that didn't hurt, let me say it again. Your harshest judgment on others will often reveal your deepest weaknesses. You see, those things that you judge in other people are most likely the same things you're struggling with. The errors that you see in people's lives, the easiest are the errors that you find a hard time dealing with in your own heart. Come on, when you find yourself quick to judge, it's often a sign that you should go look into the mirror. Think of it. We're quick to to pass judgment. That person doesn't submit under authority. They have an issue with authority. Okay? Do you have an issue with authority? No. 
I think you do. Go and look in the mirror. I can't love this person. They sow this and that and the other. Okay? Go and look in the mirror. Aren't you the same? Don't you have the same traits, the same characteristics in your life? Don't you have the same thread of stuff that's going on? You see, when we pass, when we pass our harshest judgment on someone else, it's mostly a reflection of the issues that we're dealing with the most and struggling with the most. That's why don't pass that judgment hypocritically. Work in your own life first. And maybe before you pass that judgment, get to know the person, and you'll find that they're very much the same than you. Very much on the same level, very much the same past, very much the broken history that you have. Jesus says, don't judge superficially. It's just as well as, as a guy freaking out on his friend for looking at pornography, but meanwhile he himself is stuck in an affair. Same thing. People do that. People love to do that. The third thing is, never hold non-Christians to Christian standards. 1 Corinthians 5.12 says, What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside God will judge those outside. You know how quick we are to be like that. Hey, you non-Christian, you're not acting like a Christian. Duh. <laughs> They're not. So you can't hold them to the same standards that you are living for. You can't expect of them to live like a Christian if they haven't met Jesus. If they call themselves Christian, yes, then you by all means have the ability and the right to reprimand them. But if they are not Christian and they openly confess that they are not Christian, then don't hold them to the same standards. God will judge them. And that's more scarier than anything else. I love it. People are like, only God can judge me. That should scare the crap out of you. If only God can judge you. But God says we can judge one another. He commands us to judge one another. Judge correctly. You see, when someone is not a Jesus follower, you can't hold that person to Jesus standards. So we don't point out the sin in non-Christians because we can't change them. But we can introduce them to a God who can and who will. And that's why when it comes to people outside the Christian circles, we love them. We don't judge them. Because they don't follow the same standards. So we invite them. You don't have to belong in a church or belong to Christ before you can belong in a family where people can love you and say, you know what, you are welcome here regardless of your sin. We will tolerate that because we want to point you to a God that can change that. But you see, once we become part of the church, we judge those inside the church. We need to speak correction. The fourth thing and the last thing is always help other believers who have fallen to be restored. You see, and, and this is going to be all of us at one point or another. All of us are going to fall at some point or another. It's you, normal. It's part of life. You can't live at the mountaintop 24-7. And here Paul comes in Galatians 6 verse 1 and 2 and he says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. And this is where they say, if you've been there, help someone else through it. You know, it's the most selfish thing that someone has been saved by Jesus and he doesn't lead others to Jesus. I believe Christians who don't reach out to other people, non-Christian and Christian alike, people who don't reach out are the most selfish people alive. Because you've met a God who can change it all, but you don't want to introduce him to other people. Think about it. Jesus calls us to judge. He says, go to that person, help him, restore him gently. Come on, how many of us want to lay the smack down when it comes to this? You're caught in a sin. Ah, repent. 
For the kingdom of God is at hand. Turn or burn. You heathen. No. Gently. <laughs> Not harshly. Because Jesus was gentle with you. He gave you time. And he gave you space to change. And he still does. That doesn't mean he tolerates the sin. Oh no, he hates the sin in your life. Trust me. And if you habitually carry on with that sin, he will deal with it sooner or later. And that's why he gives you the time to deal with it before he needs to deal with it. Because I promise you, if he deals with it, it's a painful thing. But he gives you time. You see, the most important thing when this comes is relationship. And that's why the, the, the Bible calls us a family of believers. There needs to be relationship. You can't go and correct someone that you don't know personally. Because it's not your place. You see, you can't speak into someone's life unless there's friendship, unless there's relationship. Friendship before function. It's always that way. So before you want to correct someone on their submission issues, before you want to correct someone on their lying problem, before you want to correct someone on the fact that they see things differently than you do, you know what? Get to know them personally first and find out why they're that way because maybe you can help them better than just passing a judgment and saying, oh, who durf jy so wees? See, God wants us to restore. See, people receive better from those they know than from those they don't know. That's how it works. That's why it saddens me when, when people say, I'm a Christian, and then all of a sudden on their Facebook status, you see in a relationship and you see it's with the same sex person, and then it's like, everybody is like, oh, I'm so glad you came out of the closet. What? I'm so glad. Okay. So now we're all of a sudden glad that people are going to burn in hell. How can you say that? We need to love people, but we need to speak truth into people's lives. You can't just tolerate sin all the time. You can't just allow things to go all the time. There needs to come a place and a time in your life where you need to say, listen, the sex before marriage in your life needs to stop because it will destroy you. Why do I say it? Because I love you that much. I care enough for you and your eternal life that I don't want you to end up where you shouldn't end up. Listen, your drug problem is a problem. Can I help you work through it? You see, it's, we always do it with love. Love should be your number one motive in correcting anybody. Why? Because Jesus' motive was love. Jesus' heart was love. Jesus came, how? He brought grace and he brought truth. Why? Because truth is a lot easier to receive when there's grace in that truth. But you know, we as people and as churches tend to go to either the two extremes. See, sometimes people live with the motto, all truth and no grace. You know, it's just truth. There's no grace. You're a sinner. You're a heathen. Change your ways or you will burn in hell. Nah. All truth, no grace. What does that do? It chases people away. It's what causes people to go, look at those Christians, they're hypocrites. They're so judgmental. Maybe, yeah. We need to judge, but we need to judge right. How do we do it? In love and grace. So we speak about the issues. You know, and that's why you'll hear from this pulpit, we'll speak about sin. Why? Because it's a problem. And it needs to be addressed. And people hate it. But we can't just let it go because we love you too much to just let it go. You see, all truth and no grace turns people away. But then there's the other extreme, which is all grace and no truth. And this leads to a license to sin and live as you please. You see, if there's all grace and everybody is, oh, it's, it's the grace of God. God is so gracious. God is love. He will forgive you, brother. Oh, come on. You can just keep on sinning. Just carry on with your life. Live how you want. God's grace is sufficient. Rubbish. You see, what sets us free? Truth. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So there needs to be a balance between grace and truth. 
You can't just ride the grace train all the time and say, oh, but God will forgive me. He will keep on forgiving. He will keep on forgiving. I promise you, the same God that is in the Old Testament that opened up the earth to swallow people up, He's the same God that's still alive today. And God is slow to anger. Praise God for that. He's very slow to anger. But I promise you, when He gets angry, you don't want to be on the wrong side of His judgment. So don't push the limits. Don't push the boundaries of God's grace. Because people are are so often pushing and pushing and pushing. How far, come on, how many relationships? People who are not married. Biggest question they often ask. Hoe ver is te ver? As jy dit vraat, jy klaar te ver, gaan in die eerste plek. Come on, why do we want to ask? How far is too far? Because we want to walk on the edge. But I promise you this, when you walk on the edge, Satan will bump you off. God's grace is so big in my life and I appreciate the grace so much that I will walk as far away from the edge as possible. If that means I'm not allowed to even hold my girlfriend's hand, then I'll do that. Because I don't want to walk on the edge where I can fall into sin and where I can destroy my life. Jou ander mense rook en hulle kom niks oor nie. So what? Why do you want to push the boundaries? Jou ander mense drink en hulle is ok. They fine, they can drink as much as they want and they fine. God still forgives them. Why push the boundaries of God's grace when you know better? Come on, Paul says it. If God's grace abounds, should sin even more abound? Certainly not. Because we've been saved from that sin. You get up from it and you walk away from it. But there needs to be balance. Truth and grace. You can't have all truth with no grace because you'll chase people away in your life. And you can't just live by grace and have no truth because then you'll live a life that leads to a license to sin. So I want to ask Andre, maybe can it make him Joel? I want to ask as you here today, that you'll just close your eyes, just bow your heads for a while. Now I know I've said a lot of things and I've stepped on some toes and I've probably wrecked some theologies, but that's fine. Because I do it out of love. Because I want you to see the truth. But I want you to receive it in grace today. The Holy Spirit doesn't condemn. He convicts. He convicts of sin, but He also convicts of righteousness. Why? Because He judges fairly. He judges correctly. So I want to pray that, or I want to ask that you all just bow your heads and just close your eyes. And just for a moment, just, just do some introspection. Just do some soul searching. Maybe there are some of you and you feel more aware of certain things in your life. You feel more aware of certain sins in your life. And that's okay. Don't, don't feel judged. Don't feel condemned. Don't run away. It's the Holy Spirit pointing out things and saying, come, let me help you work through it. That's all it is. And all you need to do today is say, Jesus, I receive your grace over this sin in my life. I receive your grace over this problem. Help me to work through it. Speak truth and hold me accountable. And then I want to go further. Maybe there's some of you today and you know that you've judged wrongly. And you've hurt someone by doing so. You've passed the wrong judgment either superficially, hypocritically, or however you may have passed it. And it may have hurt someone or it may have hurt relationships. Or maybe that person doesn't even know you passed the judgment, but you have a bitter heart towards some people in your life because you've been judging unfairly. I want to give a chance for you also today to just repent of that and to go and restore relationship, restore your life. Start with your heart and fix it before Jesus today. Allow Him to come in and fix it. And then there's some of you today here that I know, you know people that the Holy Spirit has directly showed you and spoken into your heart and said that you should speak judgment into people's life in a correct way. 
that you should help people, you should speak truth into situations, you should speak over certain situations, but you've not done it because you were afraid of them feeling judged. If the Holy Spirit points that out to you today, I want you to say sorry for not judging correctly, and I want you to go and judge correctly. Go and speak into that life, but go and do it in love and grace. Go and say, listen, God has laid it on my heart. There's an issue in your life, and I've seen it from a, from a distance, and it's time that I step in and I help you as a fellow brother or sister in Christ. So if you're facing any one of those issues, whatever it might be, I'm going to ask that you'll stand to your feet so I can pray with you. Whatever, if you've judged wrongly, if you need to go and judge rightly, or maybe there's a sin that God pointed out in your life that you need to fix, that you need to bring before Him, don't you want to rise to your feet so I can pray with you? I'm not going to call you to the front. I'm not going to ask you to do anything weird. I just want you to be bold enough to take a stand for Christ and say, it's me, God. going to give one more chance. I know there's people, you're struggling, you're fighting this feeling in your heart. But God is speaking to you. I want to say, don't fight that feeling. Don't fight the Holy Spirit. Just get on your feet and say, God, here I am. Just allow Him to do what He needs to do today. I'm going to give one more chance. I don't want to miss anyone. Last chance. If you feel it's, you just want to be prayed for, you want to be prayed over, you just want to be included in the prayer, just rise to your feet. God, you see every person rise to their feet. And even those who are still sitting who are a bit scared to get up, God, I pray that today you will be in their hearts. That today you will come and take a hold, as that song said, from my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center. I pray that that would be our heart's cry today, that Jesus, you will be the center. And as you come, take your rightful place in our hearts, as you come, take your rightful place in our lives. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will come and bring the conviction of the sin and the righteousness in our lives. Convict us of where we go wrong so that we can try and repair it, but also convict us of the righteousness of God that we are through Jesus Christ. Christ, so that we can stand up and live the way you've called us to live. Holy Spirit, come and wash us clean. Come and cleanse us by the blood of the Lamb that has been shed for each and every one of us. Cleanse us of the sin, God, and wash us clean. God, I come against every addiction. I come against every sin, every stronghold in every person's life that, ho that Holy Spirit has come and pointed out. And I claim it to nothingness. I decree it and declare it powerless. And I bring those strongholds down in the name of Jesus. And I proclaim that it will have no more power over the people in this house today, God. I thank Thank you that you break the stronghold of sexual lust. I thank you that you will break the stronghold of pornography. I thank you that you will break the stronghold of drug addiction. I thank you that you will break the stronghold of alcohol addiction. I pray that you will break the stronghold of financial poverty. Break the stronghold of sickness today, God. Break the stronghold of anything and everything that holds us back today. Father, break the stronghold of a bad self-esteem in Jesus' name. Break the strongholds of suicidal attempts in Jesus' name. Break the stronghold of doubt. Break the stronghold of wrong judgment in Jesus' name. And God, I thank you right now that you just come and rush in like the living waters and just wash over us. Holy Spirit, bring revival, bring a freshness of life. Come and point out to us where we've judged wrongly so that we can repair it, so that we can go if need be and say sorry, that we will be humble enough, that we will be, be man or woman enough to, to admit that we have judged wrongly and that we will then judge correctly. 
And God, there where we've refrained from judging, where you have put it on our hearts to speak truth into someone's life, and we've withheld that, God. We've withheld that truth because we were afraid. I pray that you will forgive us for those moments, that you will let boldness rise up inside of us and give us the strength and the courage to speak truth in those lives that we love, God. But help us to speak it graciously and help us to speak it truthfully so that we can restore our fallen brothers and sisters. And God, for those of us that just are far away from you, Jesus, or those of us that don't know you, I pray that we will right now, just in our hearts, accept you and welcome you into our lives as the king of our hearts and the king of our lives. And that we will start a new journey, a personal relationship with you. Because it's not in a prayer. Salvation is not just in a prayer. It's in a, in a change of life as we start a relationship with you. So I just thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your truth that sets us free. And thank you for your love that bandages the wounds in our hearts and our lives. And we just thank you for this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.